I realized that you know I have this running loop that I was so proud of running all the way through uh, um, in sort of before all the talks, and it doesn't actually come up on the vodcast because the vodcast starts now. So I'm going to just um, remind everybody why we're here. We're here because it's Charles, Dar Charles Darwin's uh, uh, anniversary, several anniversaries of Charles Darwin. Um, this is part of the Vancouver Evolution Festival, and these are just the people who are sort of the figureheads. There are many, many people organizing the Vancouver Evolution Festival. This is just the sort of figurehead organizing committee. Um, a couple of these people, three of these people you've already met, including myself, Arna Moores. From Simon Fraser, we, we have uh, received a lot of support from the Faculty of Science and the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, and from Continuing Studies, and Pat Gallagher and Laurie Wood have been um, critical in organizing this particular series within the Vancouver Revolution Festival. And then myself, Corey Watson, and Devin, Simon, and Tyler have been out front and doing a lot of the other um, organizing. From Simon Fraser University, there are actually three um, separate institutions. So there's the Faculty of Science, uh, and then the Center for Biodiversity Research and the BD Biodiversity Museum have both contributed uh, a great deal, both to the festival and to this particular um, series. So I'd like to acknowledge them, or we would like to acknowledge them to you um, for all their help. Now, I'm going to switch. I want to read the introduction that I have, because we are, uh, once again, uh, very fortunate to have um, uh, a, a true specialist speak to us this evening. So I have to, no, what I'm going to do is I'm going to shutter this, escape this, and go here. Dr. Noren Zion has just arrived. He is currently an associate professor of social uh, uh, psychology at UBC. He is also a faculty associate of the Peter Wall Institute, which is sort of a research think tank institute um, uh, for advanced studies. And he's a co-director of the Human Evolution Center, uh, Human Evolution Culture and Cognition Center, also at UBC. So his areas of research interest, he sent me a list, but it is pretty much encapsulated in this evening's talk. His, this evening's talk is uh, uh, his area of research and his area of interest. Um, he received his PhD in psychology. Uh, at the University of Michigan in 1999, where he did interdisciplinary graduate work in the departments of anthropology and psychology. And uh, prior to coming to UBC, he was a postdoctoral fellow uh, at the Cole Polytechnique in Paris, and he also served on faculty at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. So, he's co-editing a book on this particular topic. He's written over 40 articles uh, uh, on this particular topic. Rel uh, rel related topics. Um, his work has been profiled in uh, min lots of media outlets, uh, all the way from the New York Times uh, through the Toronto um, Star and our own Vancouver Sun. And he just heard a couple days ago, or he just told me a couple days ago, that he is the recipient of the 2009 Killam Research Prize for promptness, uh, for uh, research. <laughs> and... <laughs> It is an honor, and it has been an honor, and I should say this now, because this is the last chance I have to say this. Um, but before I say this, I will say that for the people who just came in, after this evening's talk, there is a reception. We have 100 small pencils. We have 100 um, quizzes. These are open book quizzes. If you would like to get, if you pass, and you would like to get a commemorative uh, plaque to say that you have passed this course, we haven't quite figured out what, what we're going to call it. Uh, my wife suggested we call it Darwin's Little Helper Award, but... Um, then you can give your name, you can leave, leave it with us with your, with your name and email, otherwise you can just take it home or recycle it. Now, having said that, I wanted to finish the sentence that I started by saying that it is an honor to um, introduce uh, uh, Dr. Noren Zion, and it's been an honor throughout the whole series to introduce all our speakers. We've had an in incredible range uh, and depth of, of speakers. So, with no further ado, Darwin and your beliefs. Okay. Thank you, Arna, and thank you for the organizers for this um, lovely invitation to present my uh, thoughts and my research to you, and uh, my apologies for my lack of promptness, <laughs> which apparently had, wasn't bad enough to weed it out of the gene, gene pool of humanity. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and uh, it's an honor to be uh, part of this, um, this series. I'd like to talk to you about Darwin and your beliefs. I'll start with some uh, news headlines that you might have seen last year. The headline says, evolutionists flock to Darwin-shaped wall stain 
Darwin pilgrims claim the image fills them with an overwhelming feeling of logic. <laughs> of course, this, uh, this is an article from The Onion magazine, which loves to uh, play pranks with many things. In this case, it's the, it's the prank about the, the battle between evolution and relig uh, the religion, which has been going on since Darwin's book was published 150 years ago. But I'm not here to talk about this battle. Uh, a lot of other people talk about this battle, and many books have been published about it. I'm going to talk about something more interesting, I think, which is the idea that perhaps Darwin can explain religion as opposed to do battle with it. Now, evolution, uh, well, religion is a puzzle, at, at least for two reasons, for, for people who, who are in, interested in scientific explanation of religion. It's a puzzle because it consumes a vast amount of resources, that's for one thing, and the benefits that people get out of religion are at least not entirely clear. There are many thoughts and speculations about it, but there, there is no uh, obvious uh, uh, re, uh, possible clear reasons that jump at us. The second reason that religion is a puzzle is that the beliefs that religion re re revolves around are largely unverifiable. So the question is, why would people believe in unverifiable things and passionately be committed to it and expend vast amounts of resources for it. I hope that at the end of this talk, you'll have some idea of some possible answers to these questions. Okay, I'm gonna start with the secularization hypothesis because I think this hypothesis is a very influential idea that is shared by many people in academia and, uh, and other, others, uh, has derailed the study of the scientific study of religion for many decades. So I think we, it's important to consider it and see w what we know about it. So the secularization hypothesis is well illustrated by the uh, French philosopher, mid 18th century philosopher Ernst Renan, who famously predicted that Islam was going to be the last religious creation of humanity. Of course, since uh, Ernst Renan's prediction, we've had hundreds of new religions, uh, for, to just give you two examples, uh, one is, of course, the, the, uh, the Mormon religion, which, uh, if current projections are right, is going to have about a billion members, uh, which came after this prediction, with many other new religions, but the high faith is another example. So clearly religions haven't, uh, ha uh, well, clearly Islam wasn't the last religious creation of humanity, but the, the idea behind this, uh, this prediction, of course, is the idea that with the rise of science, technology, and more wealth, religion is going to fade away. And many famous, uh, all the great thinkers of, of the 18th and 19th centuries predicted this. Durkheim, Weber, Freud, uh, and many philosophers. Is this true? Well, they actually, there is a grain of truth in this, in this uh, idea. And uh, here is a, here's a graph that uh, nicely illustrates uh, the, the relationship between wealth and religiosity across the globe. Uh, so if you look at, uh, so on the x-axis you see the per capita GDP, um, average GDP in each country, and on the y-axis is religiosity. It doesn't really matter how you measure religiosity, by the way. You look at belief in God, you look at church attendance or religious attendance, rather. Uh, you ask people how important is religion in your life, you get more or less the same pattern. The more wealthy, the more educated uh, countries are, the less likely people are religious. There is one glaring exception. Can you see it? <laughs> It's the United States. And that's a totally different talk. I'm not gonna even go there. But there are some really interesting debates going on in the social sciences about why is it that the United States is here instead of being here with the rest of the flock where you know, rich, industrialized uh, democracies are. Uh, however, even though this is true, there is, this is a strong trend and is important, this does not mean that religion is fading. And you might find that this, this is a contradiction, but I'll explain why it is not a contradiction. Let's start. For one thing, there are 10,000 religions in the world. Uh, uh, by one uh, re reasonable estimate, there are two to three religions created every day. Okay? This doesn't mean, of course, that the, all of these religions succeed in the marketplace of ideas. In fact, quite the opposite. The vast majority of new religions don't make it. This is, it's, a, it's a ferocious Darwinian world out there. Many are chosen, few are, few are, um, are, are, are saved or selected. Uh, and that's actually the, the thing that I would like to explain. Why is it that some religions make it? Why is it that some religions uh, are powerful enough that they conform or they, they, they work in terms of, our, uh, of human nature, of the human needs, and others don't do it? <clears throat> 